Welcome to another episode of Bringing Down the Grindhouse, a podcast where we discuss horror and media. And today we are discussing the girl with all the gifts. I'm Justine. And I'm Jonathan. And today we're actually alone. It's just us two. Yeah, we're down <laughs> two people. But they need a few days off, so we decided to do just one film this time and this film is actually available on netflix if you want to go take a look at it and then come back to the podcast because we do have spoilers yeah definitely i i highly recommend going and watching this movie i'm really happy that i stumbled across it i was scrolling through the uh horror section and it was uh on one of the trending uh, movies right now. It's pretty interesting, actually. You're talking about the popular on Netflix yeah. tab that shows up? Yeah, or... yeah, yeah. Okay. Mm-hmm. I, I always like going through that because they're good about including both American films and international films. Yeah, yeah. Netflix has always been pretty dope mm-hmm. about including international films. And this is one of those UK films that is good, but unfortunately didn't really make its money back when it came out. Yeah, definitely. <laughs> uh, what are the stats on that, actually? So I was taking a look at it there wasn't a fully set budget but from what i could find the budget was roughly four million great british pounds and they made about a million six hundred thousand great british pounds back Mm. and so the movie didn't really do well in the box office but critically it's pretty acclaimed ends up Mm. getting a good score it has like an 88 percent on rotten tomatoes if that means anything to anybody uh was the film released in theaters or was it just a streaming release yeah so it was a theater release and it was actually funded by the bfi which is the british film institution and they are actually uh pretty legitimate in england they usually will collect money for these things and then give them to directors to create something that they think is a worthy project and they've done this with quite a few films so it was sponsored by people who really believed in the film but i guess people really did didn't take to it they probably didn't like the premise or how it ended it um and it probably had to do a little bit something to do with uh the fact the main person's black Mm -hmm. it's just not a popular thing in the uk yeah definitely at least not recently Mm -hmm. i i think they're trying to start to be a little more inclusive but the general population is a little slow to catch up to that It is considered to be a British post-apocalyptic science fiction horror film, which is a a mouthful. (laughs) Yeah, no kidding. (laughs) Right at the start. And so it blends together a lot of genres that you um, will usually be put together, but in a much much different way. It's unique. Mm -hmm. It ends up being a zombie story that focuses in on one of the main characters. I believe her name is Melanie. But the way that the virus spreads is different. It's a fungus. Yeah. And, you know, I was sort of reluctant to watch this at first because... I've seen way too many zombie movies, you know, ever since, what was it, yeah. like, around 2012, I feel, like, 2011, 2012, there was, like, a big zombie rush in the media, you know, there was all these shows and movies, zombie this, zombie that coming out, and I feel like I kind of got sick of it a couple years after that, you know. Um, well, they had a lot of stuff, they had, like, the Day of the Dead stuff, Dawn of the Dead, they had the Santa Clarita Diet, which was on TV, which was, like, a horror comedy. Zombieland. They had Zombieland, they also had, um... Oh God! What was that's not? Uh, I think it was I Zombie, which is a weird movie. Yeah, I haven't seen that. One, <laughs> there was there's a few different things, and people mm-hmm. have just been beating this to death with all <laughs> yeah. of their versions of how a zombie feature should be. Mm-hmm. And this one is unique. It ended up being much more unique yeah. than I expected. Yeah, definitely. I feel like it it showed the zombies less of being like a an infection caused by humans, but rather like an outside force. It was its own being before, and it sort of took over human bodies as a form of survival yeah so i don't know if i missed it while i was watching it but did they mention that this was just a a fungus that spread amongst like all the people on earth yeah pretty much um i don't think they really explained where it came from either but somehow this fungus showed up on earth and uh began to manipulate humans it would wrap itself around their brain controlling their cerebral cortex and, you know, rendering them helpless, making them essentially zombies. And the fungus would have the need to feed because essentially it was growing. Yeah. So what it looked like it was doing was getting these uh, people to go and eat other people and then come back to a central place where it would then like take it into itself and roots and things would grow out of it to create these little pods. Yeah, these seed pods. Yeah, where once the they spores. explode, yeah, exactly. They're mm-hmm. spores because it's fungus. And then when they mm-hmm. explode, they would send this out into the air and then now the virus is airborne. Mm-hmm. So it was like it was like a symbiote. It right. was like wanting to create a bigger version of itself and evolve. Because before the fungus would require uh, a liquid transmuta- or transmission. So yeah. you'd have to like bite or somehow get their saliva inside your system. 
in order for the virus to spread, then the fungus would then root itself into your system and take. Yeah, over. exactly. It's so you're quick too. It was within yeah. a matter of seconds that the body would be taken over. Um, God, what was that movie? Uh, World War Z does the same thing, yeah. where you get bitten and it happens in like thirty seconds. Mm-hmm. And so that's why even one of the scenes has him waiting to see if he transforms before he lets him onto the the vehicle that they're in. So he's like, "Nope, just hold on. You got to wait." There's a real that scene reminded me of a really good scene from World War Z where he stands on the ledge uh-huh. and he waits yeah. to see if he transforms and he does it and he jumps back down from the ledge because he's ready to like jump off the building was world war z the one with like that that walled city and there was yes. just like this mountain of zombies yep. oh man that man. is the extreme <laughs> rage zombies in uh, that one yeah th- those are the zombies you want to avoid because you know those your cute little like meh, slow walking yeah. zombies but those were those were some next level ninja zombies <laughs> yeah they would like ru- they would rush you that that became a common thing in later films because people just weren't afraid of zombies anymore yeah so they wanted to up the fear factor and figured out that if you have them just running mm-hmm. then they would that would be something that scares people that movie had something unique too because they found out at the end that the zombies were only looking to attack people that they were that were healthy they yeah. they went over people who were sick anyone who they thought there was going to die they would just leave them alone mm-hmm. and so he fu- he figures out that if he infects himself with a certain virus like common yeah, cold or something right. like yeah. that then mm-hmm. you could potentially fight against the virus and that's how the movie ends so it's it's different in that way and so it's cool to see another film that's unique where i guess the premise was that the kids that were born during this time also had this virus but they were also mm-hmm. human so they had to like they they could keep their consciousness while also having the need to feed on things yeah that was so interesting because essentially these uh women who were infected with the fungal and vi- virus infection while they were pregnant then transferred the infection to the fetus yeah and when the fetus was to the age where it could be born rather than <laughs> being born the normal way the fetus ate its way out of the mother this is the gnarliest piece of body horror that i don't think anyone's really explored before like what would happen if a pregnant woman got bitten or got the virus and then just had a baby inside her the the baby would get the virus as well i mean they did do it in dawn of the dead but the baby was just born dead and it didn't it didn't eat its way out yeah it like it was actually like born and uh-huh. so that was weird to see. But then this takes it to the next level of, oh, they actually ate their way out of their mother. Yeah. And makes it a really violent process. Right. So how this movie starts is it's this uh, facility, this military-like facility somewhere. And there are these group of children that are in these like weird wheelchair-like structures to basically keep them immobilized. Yeah, it's to restrain them. Mm-hmm. So these are the children that were born from these mothers. Yeah, and they keep them all there to study them, I think. Mm-hmm. One of the scientists involved is trying to find a cure, essentially synthesize a vaccine yeah. from one of them. Yeah, and the interesting thing about these children is because they were born with the infection, in a way they are both human and zombie. They have... The, the, the fungal infection, but they also have autonomy. Yeah. And so they have the ability to control what they do. They're not complete mindless zombies. They're but they are way, also yeah. driven by the need to feed. Exactly. They're in a weird in-between where they're able to consciously think about all the things that they want to express while also having to deal with that hunger. Mm-hmm. And so, like, that's interesting because, so the story itself, uh, the film adaptation was actually written along with the book. So the guy who wrote it was Mike Carey, and the person who directed it was Cole McCarthy. Mike Carey wrote both of these together because he had planned on making a movie and a book deal. And he did the book first, and then he got someone to direct the movie and got the BFI behind it. And so they were able to make the film. And he the, the only thing he changed about the story was that... The book follows five different characters, so you get a view from all of the main characters, with uh-huh. the ones you see in the film. So the scientist, the two soldiers, the woman who's overseeing her, and then Melanie herself. And then you also have, uh, I think, like one other person. But in the film, it focuses more on Melanie as the main character and how she feels about everything that's going on. Mm-hmm. Um, and then one of the other things I found that was interesting was that it only took seven weeks to film this. And they filmed in certain pieces of Birmingham, in the city in England, as well as the West Midlands. And then they also shot in Pripyat, which is in the Ukrainian town where the Chernobyl disaster happened. Yeah, so those over yeah, the over the city shots are actually real. 
The only thing they added in was certain elements of the buildings being destroyed. I was wondering about that because watching it, you had mentioned real. too. You were like, "This is the best CGI I've ever seen." It's actually not. <laughs> yeah. They actually, it, they went, actually to, went, yeah. <laughs> they went to somewhere. They went to the the abandoned city near Chernobyl, and if nobody knows what that is, it's when the um, the nuclear power plant basically melted down and released toxic radiation into the air and it killed everything within miles of the facility and no one's been back to this yet because the radiation levels are still too high Mm -hmm. so they sent in a drone to record these pieces which is really cool yeah so they were able to get that post-apocalyptic feel during the film and it works really well for the story because you only really follow these five people and it somehow condensed a zombie apocalypse to such a small story I think that was what really stood out to me and it was interesting. It was definitely happening, I feel like, at sort of the turning point for a lot of things because they'd already been in this uh, apocalyptic setting for a while now, it seems. You know, they had their facility set up. They had been raising these kids for several years now. Um, But at the point we find them in the story, uh, the base seems to be, yeah, the base is overtaken by a horde huge horde of zombies yeah it's just like any other zombie film you can't really be safe anywhere for Mm -hmm. very much time because eventually they'll break in and then you always got to be on the move so it sets a time clock on it pretty quick pretty quick when they have to leave and so i think this facility's main purpose was for the children it was basically a research facility it was research and also an education center because these kids were being put in classes where they were being taught things that you know right normal kids would be taught in school well, so pretty early on, that actually leads me right into what I was going to ask. So you have classes with these children and the main woman is reading them stories. One of the first stories that's mentioned is Pandora's box and the story of uh, Epimetheus and Prometheus. So what do you think was the purpose of bringing a Pandora's box for the whole story? Was it like an analogy? Oh, definitely. Um the whole story sort of centers around the idea of monsters, and that's really what right. the premise of Pandora's box was, is this box of essentially mystery It was it, and monsters. <laughs> there's so many interpretations of it. Yeah. One of the main ones was that there's going to be evil and bad things inside the box, mm-hmm. but some other people interpreted it as there was everything in the box, so good yeah. and evil. Mm-hmm. Um, and one of the only things that remained inside of it was hope, and that's meant to be the only thing that really drives humans. Because in the original story... Uh, uh, Ep- Ep- what is his name? Um, Epimetheus. Ep- God, I can't say it right. <laughs> uh, Epimetheus and Prometheus were charged with giving out gifts and characteristics to humans. Prometheus stole fire, which is what he ended up paying for later on. And Epimetheus um, was charged with giving all of these traits to animals and then to humans, but he had nothing left after that. So do you feel like in this case, Melanie was Pandora? Yeah, definitely. Because, uh, I mean, I don't want to jump to the end, but I'm going to jump to the end real quick. No, that's fine. She sort of opened the box of chaos in the end with the tower when she burned that. You yeah, know? she essentially she releases sort of, everything. Yeah, she kind of came full circle, I feel, because she was, I feel, like the box herself, you know? Yeah, they were afraid of who she was and how she might react to things because she was super nice Mm -hmm. and respectful and polite, but they knew that she also had that trait that she would want to eat someone. Yeah. It was interesting, though, because she really kept that in control. There is a scene, you know, um, in the classroom where the teachers are not allowed to touch the students. Right. Because it might trigger their hunger instincts. Yeah, they smell you and they'll start to want to eat you. Yeah. And so one of the teachers, after Melanie shares a story that she had written in class, comes over and like touches her on the head, you know, very tender moment. But one of the guards sees this and is like, hey, you can't do that. And has to give the teacher a reminder of why you can't do that. And they, they have this blocker gel that the, the staff all wear that prevents the kids from smelling them so they don't have right. their instincts triggered, basically. And he rubs a little bit of it off so a kid can smell it and triggers him. Well, then, he, like, spits on his arm. Yeah. He <laughs> spits on it so he could rub off the gel on his arm. Oh, gotcha. Okay. Yeah. And then has her, like, or has the kid smell it. <laughs> mm-hmm. And then the kid uh, basically turns into this. Well, he doesn't change form but he changes behavior yeah he wants to he starts like (laughs) chopping his teeth teeth yeah and reaching towards him yeah it's pretty wild yeah and it sets off like a chain reaction in the classroom now all the kids behind him slowly one by one start activating into this mode except for melanie except for melanie she surprisingly was able to keep everything under control and you know it's interesting there's so much symbolism in here because she's sort of like you know she's the only black girl in the class she's sort of a token character to begin with 
She's also the only person who can really seem to control her gif. Yeah. Uh, there's another scene where they're breaking out of the base after the, the zombie horde has invaded the base. And um, she's trying to protect the teacher that she's become very attached to, you know. It's and, uh, Helen Justineau Justineau, is the is yeah. the uh, um, teacher and or, I don't know, scientist? They didn't yeah. really explain. She's a staff member. Yeah. Also apparently military trained. <laughs> Right, yeah, because she uses a gun later on in the film and knows mm-hmm. how to use it. Uh, but there, she was basically detained because she was trying to protect Melanie. And Melanie uh, instinctively just went and attacked these officers that were restraining yeah. uh, Helen. Yeah. Which was really interesting. But after she had activated that, she just kind of like chilled out and was like, okay, I'm done. <laughs> yeah, she laid down and just kind of like almost passed out. And then yeah, Helen picks her up. I noticed that too. Anytime the creatures eat, they seem to like get really drowsy. Like, remember the first scene when they were fed those mealworms while they are in their right. cells, basically? Uh, the children were fed mealworms because they have to eat living flesh. So they can't eat normal yeah. human food. You so can't just give them cooked food, apparently. In order to sustain them, they give them things like bugs and small animals. Right. Well, this goes back to what we were talking about earlier, where it seems like the virus was trying to gather up, like, living material so that it could then transfer it to this main tower where all of the pods were so that it could spread itself further so it was acting very much like a virus yeah it's intended to like spread around and be really resilient as things like that Mm -hmm. but what it made me think of too with all of the pandora's box references was this idea of how they felt about women in general yeah and so the idea that they had in the mythology was that Pandora was sent to Earth to bring, like, evils into, like, the world of men, basically. Yeah. And it, that always seems to be the case whenever it comes to something like that. Like, you look at yeah. the Garden of Eden, they get kicked out because of the... the... feminine energy is always seen as something dark and yeah. mysterious and troublesome, you know? Yeah. And this is on top of the fact that she's black as well. And there's yeah. all... There's, like, overtones... Well, I'm sorry. There's undertones of racism and how people feel about people of color within the film itself especially in regards to how they treat melanie Mm -hmm. and so they use this analogy of her being a zombie for the justification as in like she's dangerous she's an animal she's going to be the one who's going to respond to you like this and this gave me so many illusions to how people felt when they had slaves they Mm -hmm. thought they were animals but interesting enough, in the same way, these people could not survive without her. Yeah, exactly. They are oppressing her, but in the same way, she has something that they don't because these people are trying to live in this dying world. Well, this world is dead already. The world that they used to know, these adults, these normal humans used to know, has ceased to exist, and it has evolved into something else. And Melanie is pretty much the key to survival because she can exist in this world and still maintain her autonomy, you know. And so... In a way, they're repressing her, but they still need her regardless. They'll, they'll let her out when they need her and lock her back up as soon as she's done yeah. her job. Yeah, uh, this also gives me the impression of how authority figures feel about kind of the rest of us. Yeah. And so the disparity between people who are the haves and the have-nots, which is like the most common one you'll see amongst things. Mm-hmm. And in this case, they are losing ground very quickly. They realize that they're not going to be able to survive most of this. Yeah. And it gets completely turned on its head at the end. Yeah. So it happens after the base is overrun. Pretty much everybody dies. All of the, the, the humans were killed. The children eventually, we find out, survive because... The no zomb- one attacks them. Yeah, the zombies, because they have the, the infection as well, they don't see them as food. They see them as family, basically. Right, yeah. <laughs> and so they leave them no harm. Um, and so Melanie escapes with a group of, what is it, about five, six it's, uh, people? It's like three other soldiers, a sergeant, and the teacher as well as the doctor, who, yeah. who actually was going to rip out her brain so she could synthesize a vaccine. Yeah, oh, but... Thankfully, the the horde invaded at just the right moment and prevented her from doing so. That was a rough moment. I always I always hate scenes with I, I have this weird phobia of doctors and operating yeah. tables and just any scene like that where someone's especially brain surgery. I don't know why that that concept it's, is just wild. You to can me. do it like while they're awake. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> I think in a lot of cases they have to be awake for certain surgeries. Yeah, so they don't like fucking do something terrible like while it's happening. They yeah. don't know the response. Accidentally turn some sort of wires off in your brain. Yeah, like, shit. <laughs> the doctor is Dr. Carolyn Caldwell, and it's played by Glenn Close Mm -hmm. and Glenn Close is really well-known actor she's an American actor so she showed up for this film she does a really good job as a doctor because she goes from being a very humanitarian doctor to like I want to help people I'm trying to synthesize something to the end where she becomes super obsessed and almost crazy in some Mm -hmm. way 
where she's like wanting to sacrifice her to like for like a better good but it really wouldn't have done much good if she had yeah. synthesized it there because she couldn't even get it out like it was anybody interesting else too because i feel like she bounced around with her morals a lot oh yeah you know, in the beginning when we first see her she seems very like compassionate towards melanie she talks to her in her cell gives her these little tests and stuff little quizzes and things that are entertaining essentially they're all just tests psychological exams that she's running on them right she wants to figure out like her aptitude Mm -hmm. for like how she feels about things which actually makes me think of one of the other things that gets mentioned uh scrodinger's cat thought experiment gets mentioned yeah it was one of the um little quizzes or uh brain teasers that she gave her yeah and i'm trying still trying to figure out why did she choose that thought experiment for it because the, that thought experiment was meant to explain like quantum physics mm-hmm. like i don't really think it was associated with anything that was going on in the film unless i missed something i mean i i honestly wish i understood the concept better <laughs> but from what i understand is how she she talked about the experiment when melanie gave her answer she said that uh the cat was neither dead nor alive uh no she's uh melanie says that it's gone that it's simply gone oh yeah that it simply doesn't exist and then the doctor goes on to say that the common answer is that it's neither dead or it is both dead and alive right yeah so one of the main things about the thought experiment is that we have to accept the fact that if we're not physically looking at something to confirm it that the possibility of it doing one thing or another exists. And in this case, the cat is both alive and dead because we can't confirm it. And so the idea is that once you open the box and you look at it, it suddenly takes a certain route and becomes either dead or alive. And that is the main purpose of the thought experiment, to explain pieces of quantum physics. Yeah, I think kind of maybe what it relates to is this virus, is that you don't really know what this is. You know, obviously outwardly presenting, it's something... That's very dangerous. It's yeah. destruction, essentially. But in the end, it becomes new life. And so what form does it really take if it takes both forms? Is it is it a bad thing or is it also the new way of doing things? Right. And that that is actually pretty strong, uh, a pretty strong feeling that I got to when I was watching it because it seems at the end that they sort of had to accept that the earth wasn't like theirs anymore. Yeah. That it belonged to the new cast of people which was Mm. the children who were both like yeah hybrid humans they were hybrids but the thing is is that the way they felt about them was that they were a dangerous mix Mm -hmm. as opposed to like oh this is a blending of things yeah Yeah. this is the new evolution of humanity right and there was such heavy pushback which only makes me think of like older generations not wanting to allow children to grow yeah definitely i think it's a lot of social commentary because you know our generation each generation is just getting smarter and smarter like it's insane the things that some of these little kids can do and know and i think that's very threatening to a lot of people because this old generation their power comes from their knowledge and their understanding and you know it's hard to accept that maybe they don't have what they need at this time in life you know so do you feel then that the film was a metaphor an allegory like entirely like the whole virus and everything that was happening with the child is some larger social commentary Oh, I think the whole thing is social commentary. There's there's so many things that you could attach it to. Right. There's a lot of racial commentary. There's a lot of social generation gap, all of that good stuff. And then just the, the difference between uh, being conservative with your ideals and being more revolutionary, you know? Uh, I took it really strongly as, I agree, I, I took it really strongly as, um, the, so have you heard of the allegory of the cave? Uh, by Plato. Sounds familiar, yeah. So yeah. the allegory of the cave by Plato essentially describes this idea that uh, all of humankind is essentially these people in this cave. The story is that there's people in a cave who live in this cave are chained to the wall and they can't go anywhere the only thing that they see are shadows that come in from the entrance of the cave of the sun showing something this is their reality they get to see the shadows on the wall sometimes people break free from these shackles and move up and actually see that the sun is creating something and their reality is completely different Mm he he basically connects this to the idea that people who are bettering themselves through education break from the reality that they thought they were in mm-hmm. and then they start to find cycles exactly old cycles of understanding old cycles yeah. of thinking and then they start going into new ones and explaining what the world is actually about and in this mm-hmm. case it was important for them to theorize on these things because at the time say they didn't have an idea of how the sun set 
or how the sun rose. So they had a God that said they were going to do it. Yeah. And then eventually they figured out it was something different to him. That would be the breaking of the first level of the allegory of the cave. And then when you get into the third level of it, you start creating new ideas. This is when you start creating things that no one's ever heard of. It's a theory. And so that to me is what I felt like was happening here where you had the, her interactions with um, the people around her. The sergeant hates her to start with. Mm -hmm. He doesn't want to be around her. He thinks she's dangerous. And then closer to the end, he starts trusting her with right. going out further, to, with helping him. And then at the end, with actually helping him mm -hmm. because he doesn't want to become one of the zombies, he asks her to shoot him. And that, even though it's like a violent sort of act, it's, it's something also very merciful yeah. and very empathetic. Yeah, exactly. And I think that was sort of what uh, a lot of this movie discussed is sort of the... Um, I wouldn't I don't know if I should say the balance or really just questioning which is more important in a situation is having empathy or being rational. I feel like in a lot of cases, these uh, humans were overly rational. They wanted to rationalize every situation. But the thing is, is that the information they had could not rationalize what was happening in front of them. They could not keep up with the information, the old information that they had. And through Melanie's interpretation and her empathy and her understanding of something that they could not rationalize, they were able to come to new conclusions and further move up in their story. Right, exactly. They really spent a lot of time focusing the story on the evolving narrative of the characters and how they felt about Melanie herself, as well as do they consider her sort of a, like a quote unquote real person? Because they felt like if you had the virus and you were just lost, you weren't able to be fixed. And like you're mm -hmm. you're basically like an animal that was going to try to eat you. And then it also makes you question, what is your reality? Because to their right. reality, she wasn't a real human. Yeah. But there's there's a line. It's my favorite towards the end when she's talking to the doctor. Yeah. And the doctor is trying to operate on her once again. And Melanie is like. She, she gets up and she faces the doctor and she says, uh, am I alive? And the doctor agrees. She says, yes, you are alive. And she says, then why should it be us that die for you? Yeah. So that was a really powerful moment for something like that because she gets the doctor to confirm for her that she is another human person, that mm -hmm. they're on equal footing. Mm -hmm. And then at that point, she decides then like, why are we always subservient to whatever you want? And decides in that moment to just be like, no, I'm going to do my own thing. Mm -hmm. And I think in a way she sort of decides like, I don't want any of these people around with the exception of the doctor Helen or of uh, the teacher Helen. I think she can also see too that it's sort of a hopeless situation. Yeah. The last sort of beacon of hope was literally this yeah. uh, base called Beacon that they were trying to get to in the beginning of the movie. It's overrun. And it's overrun. They're actually looking to evacuate to wherever these people are. They're trying to evacuate to the other place. So it's 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 not a good situation. I think she understands that there's no other way that this could happen. Because I was thinking right. it too. I was running through all the possible outcomes while I was watching this movie. And I was like, she has to just destroy everything. Like, that's the only way you have to start over, really. And that's why she went to go burn the tower. It basically started the next phase of humanity. You yeah, know? there's a few things in that. So they originally find the tower, they find the pods, but the pods, the doctor claims, have bad, uh, um, what's she say? Bad design. Bad design. They they're, have bad design. Too thick. Yeah, you can't just throw it on the ground and crack it open. It, mm -hmm. it responds only to like moisture or extreme heat. And so this kind of alludes to the idea that she is eventually going to burn it later in the like in the film. Yeah. But this also gives the impression that Melanie has always been that source of progression in the film. And it becomes literal when she is like the spark that brings that sort of hope forward for her. Yeah. And so she ends up just lighting it on fire and it goes up like tinder it's super quick it releases everything even the it's like a sad moment too because the sergeant actually cared about her and ran out to go and find her but then gets exposed himself and she even tells him you were supposed to stay inside like yeah. with helen but he's mm -hmm. like i was worried about you and then he realizes what she's done but he doesn't seem upset about it i think he too realized in that moment that that was the only way that it was going to end you know right and this ends sort of the way that a lot of zombie films end where uh, almost everyone dies and not a whole lot of people get away. But in this one, they actually added in another piece to the ending, which was that she was moving forward. Yeah. And so this last scene with the tower uh, was really interesting. I, I noticed a little symbolism there 
uh, if you are familiar with tarot cards, yeah. there is a tarot card called the Tower. Yeah. Which depicts a tower that's struck by lightning, on fire. Just lots of crazy shit is happening to this tower. And essentially, the card is representative of danger, crisis, destruction, but also liberation. Okay. And I feel like that's essentially what happened in this moment. Yeah. I mean, we were going through this process throughout the movie. There was the danger, the e- immediate danger of the zombies. Um, the crisis of the overrun, being overrun by the zombies, trying to find a new place to find a home, basically. Right. And then realizing that there is no home and everything falls to shit. <laughs> so we enter the phase of destruction. But at the end, then we reach a phase of liberation, actually. Yeah. Ironically, though, the teacher who was teaching Melanie in a secluded and like locked up sort of space ends up being reversed. Melanie's on the outside um, completely free because there's no humans basically left after that, I would assume. And then Helen is locked inside of like a moving vehicle that's like a lab. And she ends up teaching the children from inside there. So she's teaching them from a locked cage, Mm -hmm. which is like if she opens it, then she dies. So Mm -hmm. you have a complete role reversal from the beginning where you saw Melanie like in bondage basically through the whole thing. And she grows up like that. She has no other reality. And that's why the allegory of the cave hit me so hard because uh, that was her reality up until it was broken when she had to leave the base and didn't know anything. She walked around the houses like she had never seen certain items that were there. Yeah. Oh, I really love that scene where she was actually able to go off on her own yeah. for the first time. Um, so that scene starts where they finally get to London. I believe they were traveling into what is now post-apocalyptic London. Yeah. And Helen comes across some clothing that she gives to Melanie. Uh, it's a nice little jean t-shirt combo with some red shoes. Which is super important. Yeah. So the red shoes are a really common symbol used in a lot of movies. Yeah. Uh, for example, like the Wizard of Oz, the yeah. ruby red slippers. Yep. And the red shoes are a symbol of unruly woman, <laughs> which is interesting. I feel like this is like a storytelling element that sort of just happened. Mm-hmm. The same way that when you watch like older films and they have light across someone's eyes, that yeah. it's meant to, to show sinister intent. Where in this case, if you have red shoes, it was meant to display what you had just explained. Yeah, a woman going off and doing her own thing, which apparently is considered unruly. (laughs) Uh, But they're also a symbol of power and independence. And when she gets this outfit, after this is the first moment where she has true autonomy, you know. Yeah. Because she's been told what to do her entire life, locked in cages, put on a strict schedule. And for the first time, she's needed and she can do her own thing. And these people send her off to go look for, what was it, food? Yeah. Some sort of well, resources. she was looking for food and or a way to distract the zombies that were currently around the building Which that they were finds. staying in. <laughs> yes. So she, this poor dog. Oh, she no. grabs a dog, <laughs> comes over. Super cute. Drops Somehow this down. dog survived uh, apocalypse for years, by the way. Yeah, that was interesting. I don't know. It was such a small dog. It was like a poodle. I don't know what it's called. It was not a poodle. It was like, what are Uh, they? um, The Shih Tzu. uh, No, it's not a Shih Tzu. No? Um, Fuck. One of those shaggy dogs. Looks like a It was like a a brown, like like (laughs) yeah, like moppy brown dogs. Fuck, I know what it's called. I I used to see one all the time. It It was so cute. (laughs) Well, the other (laughs) thing is, is that she comes across a black cat, which eats. So the thing about this is that... Schrodinger's (laughs) cat? Well, right, I know. So one, is it Schrodinger's cat? Because that's pretty funny. But two, I felt like this was meant to... So like most commonly people think of black cats as a bad omen. Yeah. That's like the thing that is in like folklore and things like that. But in this case, this bad luck that kind of shows up in her life, she literally eats it. So it's like what... I felt like it was sort of a symbol of her like taking control of her own like destiny. And in this case, there was no bad luck because she ate Uh it. (laughs) It's funny because as much as bad cats are seen as black cats are seen as a bad omen, there are also cats in general are seen as a symbol of independence as well. Yes, exactly. So I feel like in a sense, this was her grasping her independence and consuming it and taking it for herself. Yes, quite literally. Yeah, that makes sense. I mean, in some ways, writers will do very heavy handed stuff like that because the audience can't always pick up on things like that. But this one seemed a little obvious because otherwise there'd be no reason for the cat scene. Besides showing that she ate. Yeah, she also needed to find food. So. Yeah. And the cat did lean her to the houses, which then led her to the dog, right. which got her to distract the zombies. So it was the right place, right time yeah, kind exactly. of situation. <laughs> so this leads me kind of into how did you how did you feel like about the ending? Do you feel like it had a satisfying ending? Was this meant to be positive, like hopeful in some way? I think it's 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 like morbidly hopeful. 
you know, because in a sense, it's saying that you have to release the old ways and let go of what you know in order to get past this point that seems impossible to pass, you know? Yeah. And I think another commentary is that the way to reach this point is through knowledge. And I think that was what the problem was before was suppression of knowledge and what brought the the world to this new place was just learning more. And what I liked about the ending is that, you know, these kids are existing physically in this new world, but they're also bonded mentally and spiritually to the old world through their knowledge that they're learning through Helen. Right, exactly. And so the cycle is still main, it not, the cycle is broken, but there's still pieces of the old cycle that are maintained. And so it never fully dies. It just evolves into something else, you know? Yeah, it's the idea of uh, having tradition in a future setting, as in like you respect something that had happened before and you're using that to progress forward and to not repeat certain things. Um, In this case, I felt like it was really purposeful for focusing in on Melanie as well as children because we are having a lot of older generations kind of tell younger people that they don't really know what they're doing. Yeah, it's like, you have to do it the way we did because the way we did worked for us, so it should work for you too. Right, and the ironic thing (laughs) is that it did work for them for a moment, but then they ruined everything for the rest of us. Yeah. So, like, you talk to millennial generation and Gen X after us, and you get this idea that we're all told that if we do this hard work and, like, the pull yourself by the bootstraps thing, that it's going to get you through life. But we can't because yeah. the system's broken. Maybe at some point in early stages of capitalism. Right. Like that was what it was built for. You could work yeah. hard and, you know, get your success that way. But obviously the system has become so corrupt, corrupted and manipulated. And it's just impossible really to get anywhere unless you already have sort of that foothold in something else, whether it be from your family or from any sort of other positionality, you know? Right. And in her case, Melanie did not have uh, ideal positionality being a black woman A young black woman who's also very, very different in the way that she interacts with her world and understands things. Right. This also makes me think of the idea of the other that gets uh, talked about all the time in sociopolitical classes when it comes to race. And one of the main places I saw it was like how people deal with black people and how people deal with people of color. But the reason why it's almost specifically black people is because that's like the main focal point of most people's negativity for things like this. And so one of the main things that happens is say like someone's a woman, now they're they're the other. Say they're a Mm -hmm. black woman, they're the other of the other. And it keeps adding on as far as like things that define you. So you're like you could be black you could be a woman you can be queer you can be like all these other things yeah, maybe even disabled categories and then they start pushing you further and further from what they think is the norm mm-hmm. which is usually going to be the like white anglo-saxon whatever they decide mm-hmm. and so in this way i feel like the purposeful intent on focusing on her story was important because they wanted to show that uh what was the future it was her it was a young black woman yes And that is sort of like the progression of the future. And so it was interesting that they chose a route like this because the writers are both two white dudes. So it's like kind of a surprise. Interesting. Yeah. And so it's just like, I didn't really know how to feel about that, but it is a well-made film. I think it just didn't resonate with a lot of people because the story was just a little too different, Mm -hmm. but it subverts the idea of what a zombie film is supposed to be. I think if this movie had been released in the U.S., it would have been a hit. Yeah, I think so, too. It didn't get wide enough release, I think. Yeah, definitely. It was probably one of those films that they only got into a few theaters because the money was scarce. Right. They didn't have a huge distributor to be able to get the film out. But Uh, I'm sure it's doing well on Netflix now. What year was this movie released? 2016. Oh, okay. Yeah. Uh So just a few years ago. And then I guess they must have gotten the rights for Netflix to be putting it on there because it's starting to be pretty popular. And people have sort of the want to go and see a film that is different in this way. Yeah, that was actually kind of what drew me to this movie in the first place was that the main character was a black female. And it was also of the horror genre, which is something that I find uh, a little upsetting, is that there's not a lot of diversity within the characters that are presented in the horror genre. In most cases, it's males. Uh, right. And it's white males in other cases, you know. It has heavily to do with the idea that any of the women they chose were usually damsels in distress yeah. or used for sex. A sex object, a love interest, essentially just something to sort of move along the plot, but not really a main point of the plot, not a main character, yeah. just a prop, really. Right. But in this case, we have a horror movie where a young black woman is not a prop. I mean, yeah. she's certainly treated like one, but we find out eventually that she's 
she's a lot more right. than that. Also, sex and violence are not the main points of the film. Uh, yes, yes. And that, sends, that, that is a typical trend for horror films for the shock factor. And you'll find that in certain films, it's just unappealing in some ways. It, it really brings you back to certain slasher films where you didn't feel well about it. Mm-hmm. But, I mean, the main reason why you didn't see diversity is because, one, it's a boys club. So you had all of the white dudes making films during that time. Yep. Two, they didn't let any other women onto the set except for other white women. And so that was the main reason why you only really saw white women in slasher films. Yeah. And if you ever see a black person in a film, a horror film, it's usually like a specific company that's doing black films it's Ooh, not a yeah. major label they also became a know? trope they yeah, would show up and die first mm-hmm. and that was like the main thing Ugh. that they ended up doing um one of the earliest versions of this which was changed much later in film because uh romero had done um night of the living dead and in that film the main character the black man who comes to help her gets shot in the end because they think he's a zombie yeah a piece of like strong social commentary during the 50s when he had made something like that which then got subverted much later and turned into like a joke where they would have a black person show up in a film and then they were the first victim of whatever slasher film and then the way they like sort of legitimized how they had the women in the film and how they felt about them was making this idea of someone being like a scream queen like they were yeah. they were like they were in they were using this sexuality in some way to be like um, this is their new known presence and they were like taking hold of it. But it really wasn't. It was exploitation through the, like all of the films. And so they had this weird balance of is this actually empowering to women in some way? Because some feminists would argue that it was. And then other people who said, no, it was just the dudes coming up with something and wanting to create something that was just for the male gaze. Yeah, I think the argument always is, well, it's for entertainment purposes. Right. And sex sells is usually the thing they'll tell you. But I think something we're starting to understand now in this day and age is that movies have become much more than just entertainment. They are social commentary. They are political commentary. And they reach hundreds of thousands of people. I would say movies have a lot more influence than a lot of political figures do. I think that, you know, they reach more masses. They reach larger locations, larger audiences, and they're very influential influential the people that are in these movies, you know, celebrities. Yeah. Obviously everybody looks up to what they say and do. Oh yeah, totally. And you have these influential people giving these powerful messages. I think that can be very healing to society honestly yeah and i feel like that's been the emphasis for film lately we've been seeing a lot of good horror films come out of independent companies that are sort of giving you this impression that they want to go down a different route than what we've seen already and so that ends up being something that i thought about when i was watching this film because it's unique and i think it's original it's original in a genre that is not so original it's something that you've seen done uh, like a million times over because people love zombies right and you know it's interesting is when i watch a lot of movies i feel like throughout the movie i can kind of predict what's going to happen next just based off of what i've seen before in movies but in this case there's a lot of things that surprised me a lot of little details about the lore of the zombies and whatnot that i was like oh okay well that's new it didn't follow traditional narrative like tropes. So whoever wrote it did a good job of making it unpredictable, like you said. And it ended up being an enjoyable story all the way through because you don't know what to expect next. And there's never really a dull moment. They use their quiet moments to talk about serious things. And then it goes right into having this sort of anxiety of are they going to survive through the film and what is going to happen like at the end. So this kind of leads me into one of the next ones, which is did you have any favorite scenes? Because there was quite a lot. Um, I still think probably my favorite scene is at the end, right before Melanie goes to burn down the tower and she turns to the doctor and she asks her, am I alive? Yeah. That scene, it was, it was so powerful because I think that's honestly the argument in a lot of cases for racial justice is people aren't seen as human. They're not seen as having lives. And so I think if everyone could just sit for a moment and ask like, you know, am I alive? You're alive. We're both alive. We both have incredibly complicated uh things that we've experienced and memories and all this we're all humans we're all alive we all deserve respect we all deserve love we all have the right to live yeah it was heavy it was it had a lot to do with the idea of what was the hope that was going to push these characters forward and for melanie it was that confirmation that she was a person and she wasn't just this virus that they'd been talking about Mm -hmm. um 
Let's see. One of my favorite scenes was actually when she fights the group of kids. Oh, how have we not talked about yeah. that yet? So this is interesting because it's it's a few things layered onto each other. So it's what would happen to kids if they didn't have anyone teaching them? Would they like? They were just fine. <laughs> they well, figured the, it out. Yeah. So it seemed like they reverted to like tribalism. Like they yeah. were basically all joined together, and the way that they would do it is they, they had would, their alpha. Yeah, they had one person who was in charge, their alpha, and he was the person who sort of set up this like trap. Like they uh-huh. would trap people. And he was also, you know, notably the bigger one, the one that carried the stick, the stronger <laughs> figure, the one that leaded the group. And I didn't realize how heavy handed that was. Where it's like, oh, the main alpha male is the one who carries the big stick which is really funny. yeah <laughs> and then she took the stick from him and beat him with yeah, it. yeah <laughs> she beat his ass with it uh that was yeah. yeah that's how she protects the the teacher and the soldier at that yeah. time so what happens is the kids set up a trap for one of the sh- the soldiers yeah that and he gets eaten everyone goes to try and find him and then suddenly realize that they have themselves have fallen into a trap and these kids corner uh the three of them it was the sergeant the teacher and melanie yes and, you know, the sergeant goes automatically for his gun. He's like, OK, got to do my job. And she's like, no. Yeah, that dude was Melody ready to tells shoot her, some kids. Sit down. She was like, nah, we're doing this my way. And she goes over and just starts screaming at him, I guess, speaking in their language. You know, their grunts and I wasn't whatnot. sure if it was a specific language or if it was just like that feeling of like the dominant scream of how she was going to take over that moment. I mean, I imagine it's a lot how like animals communicate because right. obviously animals don't form sentences, but the, the certain, you know, meow or bark that they do can uh, infer to something else. And so yeah, I feel like I just that. the tone of her scream or grunts or whatever she was doing indicated that like she means business, you know. And she would get in their faces, ward them off, and basically, like, cleared a circle. She was like, I'm challenging you. Right. And, you know, in most tribal cultures, if you kill the person in charge, then you some sort of you have some sort of, uh, what is it? Immunity. <laughs> uh, yeah, you, you end up sort of taking control of yeah. the situation of the group. You may take control of the group, or you may just be able to pass without yeah, being disrupted. harmed. In this case, she just wanted to pass through without being harmed. And by taking down their leader, she was like, I could do this to any one of you. So don't even try it. <laughs> yeah, I would say I would say that one was probably my favorite besides the one that you mentioned. Mm-hmm. But essentially, she actually ended up becoming their leader because in the end, in the last scene, when they are teaching the children. Yeah, you know, she gets them all in line. Yeah, <laughs> uh, she's alpha male now. It should also be noted, too, that all the children find their way there somehow yeah they they all sort of like all the jumpsuit kids well they had like a very heightened sense of smell that was one thing of hers right. is she could tell where someone had been that's how she was able to track the soldier yeah and try that, to was find pretty, him, that was pretty crazy is by smelling him and so i imagine the children were able to smell each other despite the distance and just right. followed the scent trail to each other one of the last things i wanted to mention was this idea of the white savior complex ah. that the teachers seemed to have really hardcore and they showed it in a few different ways, but drove the point home at the end where she's literally teaching from a box and thinks that she's doing something like spectacular, really. Mm-hmm. But like, it's ironic because like her life's over. She's going to die in that box. <laughs> yeah. I think there's even a moment, too, where she sort of acknowledges that she put herself in that position as being like the white savior. Yeah. And she's having that conversation with uh, the sergeant. Yeah. Oh, man. Uh, I forget exactly what was said. Um, but basically she said that, you know, this kid looks at me like I'm Jesus, like, but I'm a bad person. Yeah. Or so, like I'm not a good person. <laughs> this was weird because it's the first time you see her admit that she might not care as much about this little girl that then she cares about her and gets at this idea that like, oh, like we're not all perfect. And like she's trying to be, um, what's the word? Humble. Yeah. In the moment, but it ends up coming off a little narcissistic yeah for something like that because she's like yeah she like worships me and like yeah um but then there's a weird moment too where melanie talks to the sergeant and is like oh she likes me better because she touched me on my head she would never touch you and she makes that point to him and he gets pissed and leaves her like strapped in the chair overnight so it's like there's there's a weird moment exchange between those and how they feel about each other and like those interactions but it was weird to me that she felt this sort of bond with her that I couldn't get past the fact that I felt like she saw her more as like a puppy 
or like a pet. Or like a project or something yeah, like that. Yeah, as you opposed know, to literally like Literally walking family. her around, around on a leash. Yeah. She so, had the mask over her face like a muzzle on a dog. They chained her up. They walked her around. They would chain her up at night to sleep. Yeah. And so they like she was able to concede these points to these people where it was like, yeah, sure. Like if you let her come, then I'll let you do this. And so this is like, did she really care about her? Or was she just like trying to have some sort of control of the situation and felt like she was helping yeah but then there's also the moment where she realized you know maybe the what is it the student has surpassed the master you know (laughs) because you know they get out into the real world away from their little base away from safety and they realize that they are not equipped to deal with what they're faced with the only one who's really properly equipped is what they assumed was the puppy right (laughs) and and they all end up feeling differently about her uh towards the end of the film and i feel like the sergeant had probably the strongest like redemption for his sort of character and how he was feeling about her because yeah. he, he to me respected her in the end of his life mm-hmm. yeah i feel like it's honestly i mean it's kind of a weird thing to do but it's also very respectful to trust someone to kill you you know right and she could have easily just let him turn and then he would suffer like yeah. that and uh not be able to like have some finality to what was going on Mm -hmm. but so so ultimately would you recommend these films and what would you rate them or i'm sorry would you (laughs) would you rate what would you rate this film and would you recommend this film uh fuck uh i would i want to i'm not a film critic but i'm gonna give it five stars because i thought this was honestly just like a really great movie there was never a moment where I felt like something was like unnecessary. There are definitely moments where I was kind of like, eh, but eventually it was like kind of, it, it made sense further along the story why things happened the way they did. You know, um, it was interesting. There was a lot of things that surprised me. And I think if anything can surprise me nowadays, then that's a good movie, you know, because there's, everything's been done, you know, but if you can do something that's been done before in a way that's different, that's something special. Okay, um, I like that. I think the cast the casting was pretty good. I think I think all of the people casted for their characters were very fit for the role. Right. Um so yeah, I would I would give this a five star rating. Go watch it. Yeah, I would recommend now. it. It's easy to watch, it's on Netflix. Yeah. Um I would actually give it so I do I'll do the um I'll do the one to ten scale. Um and I'll do uh, like a nine. Like eight point five nine. And the main reason why is I feel like it could have been shorter. Yeah. If it had been just a bit shorter and they got into that main point a little faster, I think it would have had more effects than making you wait just a little bit more. Mm -hmm. Because uh, I feel like for patience for people watching the film, it's just a little too much. Yeah. Okay. I I do admit there was a moment like a third, two thirds of the way through where I was kind of like, wow, this has been going on for a while. I think we even checked the time. Like how how long has this movie been on? Because we were wondering like, what's like the time frame? And it didn't have any solid markers for when the story was like progressing. I think what it is, is there's just, it was the travel time because you obviously had to show how they got from point A to point B. Yes. I think there are definitely some things that it could could have been cut down but honestly if they had cut them down it would have ruined the suspense of the moment yeah i agree yeah so and it, it did i think it worked out for what it was i think that was just more of a like a personal preference for something like that yeah um but i would definitely recommend it go and watch it for something like that do you have any final thoughts uh final thoughts watch international films more American films are kind of lame lately. <laughs> yeah, you'll find some really good international horror films. And we'll see if we can start making like a list or something that we'll put up that you yeah. guys can go check it out. Maybe like another recommended movie of the day or something. Mm-hmm. And we'll definitely start recommending things that you should go watch. Um, but <clears throat> this is pretty much it. So I just want to remind everybody that we're super easy to find. We're on all of the social media sites as well as the streaming sites. So just go and Google bringing down the grindhouse, or you can go to the website, which is bdtghpodcast.com. You can stream straight from the site or follow it through to one of the links of the streaming sites that you prefer. Our Patreon is also up. The link is on our website as well as on our social medias. Shout out to our two patrons. Yes. Woo, woo, woo. Shout out to our two patrons. One of them has been supporting us for two months now, and we just got the other one uh, at the beginning of the month. And so we're always going to have uh, bloopers and behind the scenes uh, pieces of the podcast, so things we record beforehand, as well as special segments from each of the hosts that are talking about something specific. 
We have Monsters with Murr. We have Video Games with Mitch. Some afterthoughts and maybe some other things that we're discussing with myself, Jonathan, and then we're going to get a new one soon. Yeah, I'm planning on doing a segment on cryptids where I'll be discussing, you know, little creatures like Wendigos, the Mothman, vampires, just discussing some of the lore and history of them and where you might find them in movies, blah, blah, blah. Right fun stuff we'll release that first episode of her segment onto the podcast so that everyone can listen to it and then the ones after will be put onto the patreon so you guys can go and join and you'll be able to listen to all of these individual segments in addition to the regular episodes that come out weekly but thank you so much for discussing this i hope everyone has a good night thank you my name is jonathan i'm justine have a good night